Hello, Priyanka. All set? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening All set? Good evening. All set? Yes. yes. I will check your slides. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Abhijit has checked the slides. Abhijit? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Hello, welcome. Have you checked your slides? Yes, ma'am. I checked slides. Hello. Sir, are you Dr. Niranjan Chavan? Prachi? Dr. Prachi? Unmute. Dr. Priyanka, unmute. Hello, welcome, Dr. Nikita. Hello, good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening, ma'am. I think Dr. Niranjan Chavan is yet to join. Hi, Nikita. Unmute Karo. Yes, I think uh, Dr. Niranjan Chavan is yet to join. Na? He's not seen mm -hmm. just now. Yes, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Hello. <coughs> He joining. Bhakti is not seen today. Bhakti is mother in the past, right? Huh? Hmm. Today? Hmm. Maybe two days back. But the news is, I have not seen the news. It's seven o'clock. Hmm. Oh my God. So, which news we got? Bhakti's news was not so early. Oh my God. Madam, we can start. Okay. Mm. Should I start, ma'am? Uh, actually, it's a six. Just can you wait for one minute? Okay, ma'am. Niranjan Chavan join. Yes, ma'am. Just really wait, wait for one minute yes, because already I talked with him. Okay. Dr. Abhijit is present here. Yes, yes he's there. <clears throat> yes, he's
So Dr. Komal is also joined here. Yeah. I mean, Dr. It is Dr. Komal or Dr. Niranjan? I can see Komal's name. I think Dr. Niranjan must have joined in. Hi, Komal. Hi, hey, Dr. Yeah, yeah. So I can also no. Welcome, Dr. Niranjan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, there is some... I can't change the background now, but I'll try to... No worry. Welcome. No problem. <laughs> Welcome. Okay. Yeah, Shall we start? Yeah. Yeah. We can yes. start. Priyanka? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Good evening, you. everyone. Myself, Dr. Priyanka Shelkar, working as an assistant professor at Government Medical College, Nagpur. Here, I welcome you all in October PG education program. This is a 13th series which is going on, and today we are going to discuss on malignant ovarian tumor. So, without wasting any time, I would like to request Dr. Sushma, ma'am, to start with your welcome speech, ma'am. A very good evening to all. Shubha Navratri. Aaj fifth day, Skanda Mata. Devi ka ya roop yane hum bachchon ko sabhi apatiyon se dur rakhna. Maisha Surupi Ravan, ovarian malignancy, is there to threaten our lives. So with the prayer, Ma Durga Mata, we'll start our webinar. So today, really it gives me divine feeling to welcome you all on our 13th webinar of PG Star Series by Nagpur OBJ Society in association with the Government Medical College, Nagpur. Thanks, Dr. Manjuvaikar. Now, the malignant ovarian mass is really like a demon, but it is a chupa demon, there is an occult, many times difficult to diagnose in the initial stage. So, our angels took the challenge to fight with this demon. Dr. Abhijit Vairakar, the little angel the budding gynecologist venture to fight with this demon. He is going to present a case on ovarian malignancy. Sir, other senior academic genius angels, Dr. Niranjan Chavan from Mumbai and Dr. Nikita Vijay are there to supply him different astra and shastra so that he should win the battle. He should win the battle. So welcome Dr. Niranjan Chavan and Dr. Nikita Vijay. But the Onko battle won't be ended as uh, Durga Mata fought for nine days with different avatars. In the same way, we need to invite another intelligent, talented angel, Dr. Mukesh Bang, to deal with, with this malignant demon. Now, Dr. Mukesh Bang is well versed with the Rananiti and well equipped with all updates. And he is going to speak on ovarian cancer how to treat and update. Welcome Dr. Mukesh Pan. Our another brilliant angels, Dr. Ashish Zararia and Dr. Tanishri Jain are also well equipped to provide the perfect solution of the weapons. Welcome Dr. Ashish Zararia and Dr. Tanushi Jain. Our MOC, Dr. Priyanka Shelkar will be coordinating this war very nicely. Another, our another angels, Dr. Anuja Bhalerao, Dr. Prachi Dikshit, Dr. Bhakti Gurzar, and our secretary, Dr. Pragati Khadkar, they are working and fighting tremendously for with these evil demons. And there are, so they can provide the appropriate weapons to all budding angels. So let's enjoy this war with ovarian malignancy. Thank you. You can start. Priyanka? Well, unmute yourself, Priyanka. Could Priyanka, be, unmute. Could, could we finish with Priyanka? Un yes, unmute yourself. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now uh, we are going uh, moving towards our first case discussion that is on ovarian malignancy. Our presenter is Dr. Abhijit Virarkar, and our examiners are Dr. Niranjan Chavan, sir. Uh, sir is a professor and uh, uh, unit chief at Sion Hospital, Mumbai. Sir is a president MOGs, organizing secretary at ASUG, 
sir having succeeded publication in international and national journals coordinator of 11 batches of mhs recognized certified course uh, sir is coordinating more than 3 batches of advanced minimal assess gynec surgery our second examiner is dr nikita vijay ma'am i welcome you ma'am uh, ma'am is associate professor at lata mangeshkar hospital nagpur uh, publications ma'am having many publications at national and international level uh, madam is a author of role of tranexamic acid in reducing the blood loss during cesarean section recently ma'am uh, received a international best researcher award through issn now uh, i would request uh, abhijit to share his uh, screen and to start with his case good evening everyone uh, myself dr abhijit varakar junior resident uh, working in obgy department of gmcs nagpur and today i am here presenting a case on malignant ovarian mass uh, my patient is a 70 year old uh, named abc uh, a parietal lobe to resi uh, residing at chandrapur uh, farmer by occupation uh, who is Ill illiterate and belongs to lower socio economic class Uh, came to the opd with chief complaint of pain in abdomen since last one month abdominal distension since last one month and generalized weakness since uh, last three months uh, is of present illness uh, since last one month patient is having dull aching pain which is insidious in onset uh, without any aggravating or relieving uh, relieving factors the history of abdominal distension which is gradually in onset progressive in nature uh, with bloating sensation since last one month the history of nausea early satiety generalized weakness uh, loss of appetite since last one month the history of loss of weight in uh, around 3 to 4 kg over last one month there is no history of uh, urinary uh, complaints no history of heartburn omitting no history of any discharge per vaginam any bleeding or spotting per vaginam there is no history of fever cough and breathlessness menstrual history patient has uh, attained menarche at 15 years of age Uh, had a uh, regular menstrual cycle of 3 to 4 days of bleeding uh, and 28 to 30 days of cycle with average flow patient attained menopause 21 year back and the life uh, menstrual life span of the patient is 34 years obstetric history uh, patient married at the age of 16 years uh, married since 34 years and husband died 8 years back uh, patient, she is a para 2 live 2 uh, both normal vaginal delivery uh, uneventful uh, pregnancies both delivered at home with normal purpurium The last childbirth was 43 years back, and duration of breastfeeding is approximately 1.5 to 2 years per child. There is no history of sterilization. Past history: there is no uh, history of hypertension, diabetes, tuberculosis, asthma, uh, any cardiovascular disease, uh, disease. There is no history of any malignancy or any surgical intervention. There is uh, drug history: uh, there is no uh, significant drug history. There is no history of uses of uh, contraceptive pills or uh, uh, treatment of infertility. family history uh, there is history of endometrial carcinoma in sister uh, who died 9 years back due to the same personal history patient consume mixed diet had uh, decreased appetite uh, normal sleep patterns bowel bl bladder habits are normal without any addiction and substance abuse summary of the history uh, she is a 70 year old parietal lobe to post menopausal uh, patient with vague abdominal pain abdominal distension generalized weakness since last one month associated with a associated with loss of appetite early satiety and significant weight loss with family history of endometrial carcinoma general examination she is conscious oriented to time place person thin built catch exit with height of 137 cm and weight of 45 kg bmi corresponding to 230 uh, kg per meter square she is febrile with pulse rate of 88 per minute regular normal volume equal on both side with a respiratory rate of 16 per minute and blood pressure of uh, 118 by 68 mm of mercury in sitting position on right arm maintaining saturation on room air uh, she, uh, she, uh, she she had a pallor uh, with no icterus cyanosis clubbing edema or generalized lymphadenopathy uh, thyroid and breast examination was found to be normal uh, spine examination was normal gait was normal on systemic examination cardiovascular system respiratory system and central nervous system no abnormality detected on per abdominal examination on inspection abdomen appears to be distended more in the flanks uh, the abdominal skin was tense and shiny all quadrants move equally with respiration umbilicus is midline everted 
dilated veins seen on the abdomen, no scars and sinuses present, hernial orifices uh, found to be normal and intact. On palpation, there is no local rise of temperature, tenderness, guarding or any rigidity seen. Uh, mass of aprox 15 by 15 centimeter uh, felt uh, occupying in the lower portion of abdominal region into the hypogastric region, which is variable in consistency, non-tender, with irregular surface and irregular borders. All borders are made out except the lower border, having restricted mobility. There is no evidence of any other organ megaly. On percussion, shifting dullness was present. Uh, free fluid was present in the abdomen. On auscultation, bowel sounds are heard in all the quadrants. On local examination, external genitalia appears atrophic, external urethral orifices atrophic and no uh, signs of stress incontinence. On perspiculum examination, vagina was atrophic, pale. Cervix was postmenopausal flushed with vagina and mid position. There is uh, no evidence of bleeding or any discharge or growth seen on the cervix. On pervaginal examination, cervix felt atrophic flushed with vagina, non tender. The uterus was a small size, antiverted firm, non tender, and appears adherent to the mass anteriorly. There is a mass of variable consistency which is felt occupying the right fornix, uh, of size 15 by 15 centimeter, and extending into the right, uh, anterior fornix, which is non tender with restricted mobility and irregular surface and margin. Uh, fullness in the posterior fornix felt. There are also uh, nodules felt in the pouch of Douglas, which are non-tender. On rectovaginal examination, our findings were noted uh, rectal mucosa free. Provisional diagnosis, my patient is a 70-year-old paratolito with postmenopausal woman with right-sided ovarian mass with ascites with possibility of malignant nature under evaluation. Well, uh, yes, sir. Can we go ahead, madam? Abhijit, go back to your history slides. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So your patient is 70 year old. 70 year old. If I say no age is immune for the ovarian malignancy, how will you explain this statement? Uh, Ma'am, uh, though uh, malignancy can occur in any age, but uh, some uh, malignancies like epithelial ovarian cancer that tend to occur into the older age, that is into the 60s of the patient, while some malignancies like germ cell tumor, which occur uh, earlier into the 20s of the patient, and some uh, low malignant potential tumors, which uh, occur into the 40s of the patient. Even hereditary ovarian tumor also, they Hello. Tend to occur uh, earlier. Yes. A decade earlier. Yes. Next slide. Pain in abdomen and Next slide. Okay. Tell me what are the points in your history that is uh, favoring your diagnosis? Um, I'm a uh, patient is a 70 year old. Yes. Uh, with the complaining of uh, dull aching pain, uh, abdominal distension, with history of nausea, early satiety, uh, weakness, and weight loss, okay. uh, which point toward malignant nature of the uh, condition. Further, uh, further, uh, there is no history of uh, contraceptive uh, pill uses in the patient, and on examination. Uh, there are findings uh, which suggest uh, that there is a tumor which is uh, arising from the right adnexa separately uh, felt from the uterus, uh, which can point toward the ovarian malignancy. Further ascites is present. Okay, go back to your menstrual history slide. Sir, please, you want to ask. Sir, please un unmute yourself. Madam, uh, madam, you please continue. Uh, let it be in the flow as what you want so that he will be in a better position to answer. I will I will talk later. Abhijit, I want to know how menstrual history is important in your case. Uh, ma'am, uh, in Ovarian cancers like uh, early uh, menarche and late menopause, uh, these are the risk factor for the uh, cancer. 
अरे गो बैक टू नेक्स्ट स्लाइड एंड हाउ ऑफसेटिक इज इम्पोर्टेंट इन योर केस Mam, nullibarity is also a risk factor for the ovarian malignancy. While uh, pregnancy and uh, breastfeeding are protective in nature. Can you explain how the pregnancy and the breastfeeding protect from the ovarian cancer? Uh, Mam, uh, as the number of ovulation ovulatory cycle increases, uh, this increases the risk of ovarian cancer. And in pregnancy and during the breastfeeding, uh, as ovulation is suppressed, uh, so it is protective. You know, ovarian malignancy. Okay, you have mentioned there is no history of use of hormonal contraceptive. Hormonal contraceptive pills. What do you mean by this? Um, hormonal use of hormonal contraceptive pills is also protective in case of ovarian malignancy. Their use for more than uh, five years is actually reduces the risk of ovarian malignancy by around fifty percent. Well, how? What is the mechanism for that? Um, the mechanism is same. The hormonal contraceptive also uh, suppresses the ovulation. And uh, protect from the ovarian malignancy. Anything else in the mechanism for the protection? <laughs> the OCP induces the apoptosis. Okay, so in this way, it is helpful to uh, prevent the ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer. Next slide. Excuse me. Yes. Can you just go back to this slide? What just one small mistake is that married thirty four years back he has written over there and last okay. child was forty three years back. Okay. So I think <laughs> Abhijit, please correct it. Correct. Should be the other way round. <laughs> yes, sir. Very uh, good observation by the third uh, umpire. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, actually, sorry. Um, she is married since forty-five uh, years, actually, not thirty-four. Okay, so uh, now uh, you have a ovarian tumor. How will you further uh, go ahead? I mean, uh, of course, ovarian tumor. Uh, we have uh, probably fifteen twenty minutes, madam. Now, hello. Yes, yes, sir. Sir. We have yes, sir. Sir, we have adequate time. For one hour, we can do that. No, no. I mean, uh, we both examiners, of course, of course, because ovarian tumor is a very vast topic, and uh, there are so many things which are involved. And I remember as a postgraduate student when I was there, it used to take, I used to take at least five hours to read it, and yes. cancer <laughs> to five hours to read it, and also from other uh, things. So from uh, Uh, uh from this point of the exam uh, we will try to cover as many as uh, points of ovarian cancer of course you have presented very well and uh, absolutely great but uh, 50% only 35 40% of marks you have covered now but the rest is all the all the discussion and how you answer your questions and how you are able to justify uh, your answers uh and examiner would uh, like to see that whether you are uh, uh, standing in between or whether you are on one side or on the other side so he will try to pull you and try to drag you in a wrong side but you should be able to stand where you your point of view is there and you need to give reasons for why uh, why you have chosen this answer and then that is how the further uh, marking will occur and they need to know your uh, expertise of uh, managing such a case either uh, uh, by your superior or your unit head or a professor or, or like uh, any faculty or probably you have assisted or, or you have seen so that also all counts so now now tell us uh, what are the different types of ovarian tumor you have seen in your 3 years of residency or 2 2 years of residency theoretically we are aware that there are so many different types of ovarian tumor but uh, to play with Exactly, how many types of ovarian tumors you have seen? So uh, during the residency, we have seen uh, epithelial ovarian cancer. This uh, serous cyst adenoma we have seen. Then uh, we have seen uh, thicoma uh, in an elderly patient. Then uh, we have also 
come across a uh, case of uh, you have seen only in the post menopausal and menopausal age or you have seen also adolescent girl tumors so in uh, post menopausal females okay so there are also uh, patients which are common uh, in adole- what ovarian tumors are common in uh, adolescent girls can you highlight on that uh, so uh, the germ cell tumors like digerminoma are uh, common in early 20s uh, yes yes no no then, they, are, they are even found at 14 years of age 13 years of age just yes. time of menar uh, probably your seniors might have seen it or you might have not been so uh, lucky to see all these cases but there are immature teratoma yolk sac tumor yolk sac tumor also all these things also are coming so now uh, which are common solid tumors are common or cystic tumors are common in ovarian tumors cystic tumors are common which is larger uh, whether it is a mucinous cyst adenoma or whether it is a serous cyst adenoma in the form of dimensions serous cyst adenoma mucinous cyst adenoma is more uh, larger in dimension as compared to the serous cyst adenoma and uh, what is the age of uh, age of the decayed germ cell tumors are more common disgerminomas are they more common in reproductive age menopausal or in adolescent age group more common in sir uh, adolescent age group in early 20s common from 10 to 30 years of age it is also in adolescent as well as in young women yeah. and uh, what other uh, in uh, uh, different different type of microscopy you see uh, in your ovarian tumors like uh, you will see uh, signet rings in which condition you find signet rings in Ap- krukenberg tumors we will yeah. see signet ring appearance then then the leading question is what is krukenberg because whatever you talk it will be it will be leading the the question what is krukenberg tumor the krukenberg tumor are the secondary to the ovaries from the primary uh, from the uh, abdominal from other cancers like breast cancer colon cancer stomach cancer okay so uh, it primarily arises from the gastrointestinal gastrointestinal tract right okay and less commonly from the other sides other side often these tumors are bilateral in 80% bilateral. of and they are a metastatic nature and that's how they uh, they they spread further how is the spread the spread is either transcellomic it could be lymphatic direct or hematogenous okay yes now uh, what are the other uh, tumors you you have come across uh, what are schiller dual bodies the schiller dual bodies are seen in yolk sac tumors yes you are very much right and they are found uh, uh, so what is yolk sac tumor so yolk sac uh, tumor is a germ cell tumor uh, which is seen commonly seen in uh, children that is in early ages right. children bolega to tu fir wo early 20s present 12 years of age no 12 14 years it is found in adolescent early. 16 to 18 years of 18 age years. 14 yes, years of age it's it's 100% unilateral it's unilateral. a unilateral tumor and uh, it's highly malignant rapidly growth it is soft and grayish and brownish in color and uh, microscopically there are schiller dual bodies and what are those those are basically characterized by the presence of a central blood vessel surrounded by layers of tumor cells now what is embryonal carcinoma embryonal carcinoma is also a type of germ cell tumor yes yes it is also more uh, commonly seen Common in adults and uh, it is the most malignant tumor it is the very rarest of rare the tumor markers are hcg and uh, alpha test alpha beta protein yes so these are all the different type of tumors you should be knowing though it commonly you do not come across okay and yes. uh, uh, now we will uh, there is something about uh, you know uh, screening screening also is, is screening universal in ovarian tumors or is uh, it no, no sir no universal screening is available uh, for ovarian cancer as their uh, predictivity is less yes so there were many modules which were presented but uh, eventually 
at different different age groups and uh, the different uh, types of the array of so much so many tumors around you cannot pinpoint a particular uh, uh, you know uh, uh, a method either by uh, ultrasound or by doppler or by uh, tumor markers where there are various tumor markers you cannot have a proper you cannot justify because you might you will miss out so that is the reason but the commonest one what is the commonest tumor marker you come across in your uh, practice when you have ca125 okay. what do you mean by ca125 the ca125 it is non specific marker yeah, okay no it generally... is a marker for uh, epithelial tumors how can you say it is a non specific it is it has a specificity regarding epithelial tumors serous and mucinous cyst adenoma obviously they are elevated in that it could be non specific non specific because it is also raised in also other, other like conditions immuno deficiency or uh, patient on tuberculosis drug tuberculosis or, endometriosis or gi syndrome uh, i mean uh, uh, gi pathologies or uh, as you said endometriosis that is why it, but for for epithelial tumors of course there are further uh, uh, tumor markers it's basically an antigen which is found in the fetal amniotic and the coelomic epithelium in adults and it is also found in the mesothelial cells of the pleura pericardium and tubal endometrial and uh, it's elevated uh, in 50% of stage 1 and 90% of women in advanced disease what is the normal level of ca125 no, uh, less than 35 is the normal level of ca125 nano uh, millimoles or is it nanograms per ml or is it ml per dl what i mean you should be specific about that okay yes sir uh doctor uh, madam you want to ask any further questions i just taken 7 to 8 minutes but uh, uh, you can surely go ahead okay sir abhijit what do you mean by borderline tumors uh my borderline tumors are low malignant potential tumors which fall in between the uh, benign tumors and malignant tumors uh, they uh, they have uh, features uh like uh, cellular pleomorphism uh, increased mitotic activity uh but uh, stromal uh, stroma is intact in them okay. what are the characteristics other than that um, i mean they are at the early age huh? early age that's at in the 40s of the patient and they are confined to the ovary for a prolonged period for prolonged period they so pro almost so prognosis is good 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 prognosis means yeah. only as you have mentioned there is the germ cell tumor they occur at the early age group and your patient is a epithelial ovarian cancer that is in the post menopausal patient post menopausal can you tell me how how is the management is different in these two conditions um i mean in case of epithelial tumors which generally occur in postmenopausal pa uh, patient uh, we can uh, we have to go for uh, staging laparotomy okay and uh, if a family is complete as in postmenopausal period we can go for th and bso but uh, in cases of germ cell tumor we have to preserve the fertility of the patient so uh, we need to uh, go for uh, preservative surgeries like unilateral salpingoferritin and is there any role of uh, fertility preserving surgery in epithelial ovarian cancer patients uh, is uh, uh, requiring fertility then uh, we can go for fertility preserving surgery and which if stage? the tumor is conf yes and which stage up to which stage you can go for the fertility sparing surgery in a epithelial ovarian cancer no up to stage 2 no no mam uh, in only stage uh, 1a 1a and grade a uh, grade 1 and 2 1 and 2 huh? yes. not in grade 3 yes okay. hmm.
okay uh now i am going to go to uh, before the management there are certain uh, the diagnosis sorry yes sir investigation and the diagnostic part uh, uh, yeah we will go to that investigation and diagnosis we have i think 10 minutes now but i want you to tell us what is roma index what is rmi index and what is iota classification yes uh, so roma index is a risk of ovarian malignancy algorithm in which uh, uh, the values of uh, ca125 uh, he4 that is human epididymis uh, protein factor 4 Uh, and uh, the postmenopausal status of the female is taken into consideration. According to that, uh, we can uh, the algorithm predicts the risk of ovarian malignancy. Uh, in Roca, uh, it is the risk of ovarian cancer algorithm in in which the serial uh, CA125 values are taken into consideration uh, to predict the risk of ovarian malignancy. Uh, and RMI square, it is the uh, risk of malignancy index in which three parameters are considered: ultrasound score. Uh, then uh, CA125 values and menopausal score of the patients. In RMI, there are ultrasound score will have five features uh, like multilocular cyst, the presence of uh, solid areas, uh, presence of ascites, presence of uh, intraabdominal metastasis, and the bilateral of lesions are taken into consideration. Out of these five, if no abnormality is there, then we uh, give the score uh, of zero. If uh, one abnormality is present, then we uh, give score of one. And if two or more, then give score of three. Uh, then uh, for menopausal status, the premenopausal females are given score of one and postmenopausal females given score of three. And if the R total RMI score is more than 200, then uh, it is more likely to be uh, malignant tumor. Yes. What are the limit limitation of RMI and what are the different types of RMI you know? Uh, Ma'am, limitation of RMI is that the in RMI uh, more importance is given to CA125 value, uh, which is uh, falsely uh, positive in um, some other cases also. And uh, there are different types of RMI like RMI one, two, three, four. Uh, and uh, after uh, RMI four, we uh, taken we take uh, tumor size into uh, consideration also. Okay. Any other limitation of RMI? Actually, we are using the RMI to know the risk of malignancy, but actually it doesn't tell about the risk of malignancy. What is the better risk model? Uh, Mam Roma and Roca is better. Anything else? Nowadays, uh, we are in very Ova. much in question. Yes, Mam. We can do uh, go for Ova Sure or Ova One panel. No, no. Have you heard about the IOTA ADNEX model? IOTA. 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 There is IOTA uh, classification, which is based on USG finding. They have given certain B rules and M rules. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, B rules uh, are that on USG, uh, the cyst may, uh, should be unilocular. Uh, there should be presence of acoustic shadow. There should be presence of solid components. Uh, the largest diameter should be less than seven. Uh, millimeter. Uh, there should be sure, uh, soft, uh, smooth multilocular cyst uh, with diameter less than uh, 10 centimeter, and uh, there should be no vascularity. And the uh, M rules, uh, which point toward malignant uh, tumor, uh, there are uh, there is irregular solid tumors, uh, presence of ascites, then uh, strong blood flow on uh, Doppler, and irregular uh, uh, multilocular solid tumor uh, more than 10 centimeter. And there should be papillary projections at least uh, four. Okay. What are the benign descriptor according to the AOTA? And what is AOTA ADNEX model? Uh, sorry, ma'am. What, what are the various benign descriptors suggested by AOTA group? And what is AOTA ADNEX model? Sorry, ma'am. I don't know about that. And currently, IOTA is advising two-step uh, two-step strategy. What is that two-step strategy suggested by the IOTA group? The benign descriptors are they have given four descriptors according to the pattern recognition on the ultrasonography. Okay, so they have given the unilocular cyst with the ground glass appearance. They are endometriosis in the premenopausal women, unilocular, that is uh, 
they have uh, done the modification here also they have mentioned the size also that is less than 10 centimeters second group is dermoid description of dermoid unilocular cyst with the mixed ecogenicity less than 10 centimeter size again in a premenopausal women third is an echoic cyst less than 10 centimeter uh, unilocular cyst in a premenopausal women these are the benign descriptors, modified benign descriptors they have told. And what is uh, aorta adnex model? And what is the two-step uh, strategy? They are saying in all adenexal mass, you first go for the benign descriptors, modified benign descriptors. And if they are not classified into these all four, we have uh, given one is endometriosis, second is dermoid one, third is the cystadenoma or the simple cyst, then you should go for the adenex model. Adenex model is assessment of neoplasia in the adenexa group. So the, for this, they have given nine variables. Three are clinical and six are ultrasonographically. So what is the benefit of IOTA adenex model? Then don't, not only differentiate between the benign as well as malignant, uh, malignancy, they also subgroup it further. Like in a borderline stage one or the stage two and four and the secondaries. So they divides all further divides also. They tells about the staging also. So this is the uh, nowadays this is the latest one, Adene, uh, IOTA adnex model mm -hmm. and two step strategy. Okay, now uh, we will go to the management. How will you manage this case, doctor? Okay. Uh, sir, uh, first we uh, go for uh, ultrasound. Uh, transfer general as well as uh, trans. First, you talk about routine investigations. You talk about specific investigations, and then you uh, talk about the other things. Do not directly go for ultrasound. She is a seventy-year-old menopausal woman. How will you manage this case? So, so uh, we will do the routine investigation. Says or will you admit her? That is important question. Yes, sir. Will you admit her or will you manage her on OPD basis? Uh, so we will admit the patient. Yes. Uh, we will do the routine investigation like uh, complete blood count, uh, yeah. liver function. Yes. Yeah. So, so remember always, though you are very learned and you are very good and intelligent and you are well read, but when it comes to practical exam and when you come to case presentation, do not directly jump to CT scan, MRI, ultrasound. Okay, you have to go methodically as how you have uh, taken the training during your residency program. Okay, yes. so you have to first admit her, collect her blood and send her for investigations. And you need to also do investigations uh, regarding your suspecting ovarian malignancy. That's your provisional diagnosis. So you need to uh, do blood investigation related to tumor markers. Yes, sir. So please go ahead. So, uh, in a routine investigation, sir, we will do a complete blood count, uh, liver function test, uh, KFTSC, uh, blood group. No, no, no short forms. What KFC, FC, you, I heard. Uh, sir. Uh, so we will uh, do liver function test, kidney function test, uh, serum electrolyte, uh, then uh, the HIV, SCV, uh, of the patient, blood grouping, uh, RS typing of the patient. Uh, then uh, we uh, will do the tumor markers like uh, CA125. Blood sugar, what about diabetes, PLBS, that is also important. No? They are diabetic, they are hypertensive. Yes. Yes. Then, then, uh, what then, then you then thyroid. thyroid, very thyroid good. profile. Uh, and then uh, we will go for tumor markers. If, uh, uh, if she is hypertensive or she is the, uh, you need to get one ECG done, then you need to get urine routine microscopy, then tumor markers, then imaging science comes. What other imaging things you will see? In imaging, first we will go for ultrasound. And then for CTC. Ultrasound of the brain, ultrasound of the pelvis. 
we will we will go for sir uh, ultrasound of the uh, abdomen and pelvis sir very good so what will you try to uh, see in an ultrasound uh sir on ultrasound we will uh, try to see uh, the uh, type of the uh, mass whether it is uh, uh, abdominal or it is pelvic uh, then its uh, size its nature uh, whether it is loculated or not uh, the cyst Pel wall whether it is arising from the pelvis Pel pelvis or well tumors okay then then uh, uh, whether it is multi loculated or not um, the uh, whether there is papillary projections uh, solid or uh, echogenic areas uh, are there uh, then by the help of doppler we can see uh, the a whether it is septa whether it is dividing into multiple septa what is the thickness of the septa whether it is one then you talked about doppler you okay then further what uh then uh yeah then, you were saying about uh, doppler what is ri index what is pi index pulsatility index and resistance index mm -hmm. what they happens be... to them what happens to ri and pi in a ovarian malignancy they will be decreased why because of neovascularity uh, the index will be decreased mm -hmm. okay okay now um, now we have done it uh, ultrasound and then it shows that it is a uh, mucinous cyst adeno carcinoma and her ca125 is raised along with that her beta hcg and other tumor markers are also slightly raised now and she has ascites as you said there is free fluid and there is a percussion there is a dull node in the center and she has got ascites reporting in progress sorry yeah so how will you now go ahead you have done ultrasound you have done would you like to do further imaging studies uh, yes sir i will like to do ct uh, abdo uh, abdomen and pelvis of the patient uh, to see for the extent of the tumor Uh, to look for any uh, met, uh, intraabdominal metastatic uh, lesions okay okay so uh, you need to go with contrast contrast study also what is better yes. mri is better or c ct is better so c ct is better what is pet scan uh so pet scan uh, is done if the uh, metastatic lesions uh, for the active metastatic lesions so which one is better you or you recommend all the patient with uh, ovarian tumor pet scan or you only want uh, ct scan CT, sorry ct scan ct scan sir so pet scan is not required huh, for not all required. ovarian tumors okay so that yes. is now what is the role of fnac or uh, uh, if uh, is there any role uh, so fnac uh, or you should do some uh, try to do a biopsy in such cases what is your uh, opinion on this aspect uh, sir uh, fnac and uh, biopsy are not done as they can upstage the uh, malignancy so we will directly go for uh, if They they cause spillage of the tumor cell into the abdominal cavity. Abdominal cavity. It's the uh, tumor. So you should never do any needling. You should never try to aspirate something. Uh, you can aspirate the ascitic fluid. You can aspirate if yes. she has breathlessness, if she is dyspneic, and uh, uh, that she is hypoproteinemic, she is anemia, and you need to. Uh, reduce her respiratory embarrassment in that case but do not ever put your needle into the ovarian tumor that is very important yes sir okay, now um, okay your diagnosis state that it is epithelial or it is uh, uh, mucinous or a serous cyst adeno carcinoma okay now how would you proceed uh, sir So after uh, all the initial uh, investigation, yes, 
managing we will yes we will plan the patient for a staging laparotomy why staging laparotomy why not uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy which is uh, 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 which you can give uh, first and then you can uh, give her three cycles and then you can undergo a surgical intervention uh, sir uh, if on the uh, pre operative findings we will uh, uh, think that the tum- if the tumor is non resectable or uh, the uh, st- means the uh, tumor is non resectable or there is uh, much uh, uh, the tumor is uh, uh, metastasize uh, widely into advanced, the abdomen advanced, advanced advanced tumor in case of huh, then yeah. we will go for new adjuvant chemotherapy new adjuvant chemotherapy otherwise if it is a early uh, um, ovarian cancer and uh, it has not spread to the other ovary and it can be still uh, uh, you can proceed with a cytoreductive surgery surgery then you uh, you are in a bed and the patient should be uh, fit um, Fit for the surgery. Of you, her creatinine level uh, should be less than one point. Mm. She doesn't have any renal pathology. Her blood pressure is under control. Her diabetes is under control, and she can withstand the surgery. Okay. Yes, sir. In But that. This, yeah, this is the situation here. You will do first histopathological examination of the tumor, and then only you will start the NSPT. Oh, yes. yes. Yes, yes, absolutely right, madam. Okay, now tell us about the exploratory laparotomy. What, what things you will? Yes, you are a patient now. You are operating surgeon. You are standing on the right hand side, or you are assisting the senior. How would you proceed with the uh, yes. exploratory laparotomy, and how would you uh, do uh, cytoreductive surgery? Ah, uh, sir, in a side, uh, we will uh, start with the cleaning and draping, and then we will make a. Uh, midline or para midline longitudinal uh, incision. What is the advantage of uh, midline over para medium or the or vice versa? So with the help of midline incision, we can explore the intraabdominal organs. We get a, a space uh, to explore uh, the intraabdominal organs and to look for metastases. What what uh, uh, what incision you have seen in your hospital when you have performed the most of the seniors who have done midline incision midline incision okay so oh, you mean to say that if you want to do an abdominal exploration or something then you can extend the incision above the umbilicus right yes sir uh, you know the chances of abdominal burst abdomen are more common in midline incision or para midline uh, median incision What is linear alba? <laughs> linear alba is a line which is present line above and below the umbilicus or more umbilicus. umbilicus, and it is a vascular. So if you go through that line, and when you again stick, uh, less uh, healing issues. But when you go through through the right para median incision, you can go through a zigzag. The skin subcutaneous tissue. the rectus uh, sheath and then you lift up the rectus sheath with uh, the alices and you come up till the midline and then you separate the rectus muscle from the midline then you enter the peritoneum so you have a z shape incision you can see my hand how it goes so yes. when you also there are less chances of abdominal burst abdomen secondly you can also uh, extend the incision directly upwards Rather than by uh, and uh, making a you know uh, going around the umbilicus. Around so, the umbilicus. Ah, yes, of course. Uh, uh, if you have certain uh, things related to uh, the surgical aspect, sometime it happens that you have seen that there is an ovarian tumor, but it uh, it it turns out to be a gastrointestinal tumor. Just so uh, you might have to have keep a surgical standby. or uh, there is a probability of uh, omentum or intestines been stuck up or it has ruptured ovarian tumor or there is a you know so it is all stuck up plastered so all these things you have to keep in mind and always you have to open the uh, in uh, the abdomen at the higher point okay yes okay once you have opened then what do you do uh-huh. Sir, uh, then if ascites is present, we will collect the ascitic fluid for cytology. Okay, for patient, what is there to be if? 
isn't it yes sir and as i if it is not present what will you do yes uh, ma'am uh, we can give peritoneal wash and then collect the uh, fluid for uh, cytology yes and then you take a 20 20 cc syringe or 10 cc syringe and collect that fluid yes. okay once you have opened the abdomen you are done now you see an ovarian tumor looking at you do you ever touch it or you don't touch it uh, sir we will uh, first look for the uh, extent of the tumor uh, whether it is spreading to uh, uh, where it is uh, spreading any other abnormalities uh, rough surfaces uh, you are doing it very gently because if, but some of them are uh, having uh the tumor uh, the 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 cyst wall uh there is a break in the cyst wall there is excre uh, excrescences and there is also uh, uh vascularity they are more vascular so even if you touch them with your fingers or you try to handle it much more uh, then it starts bleeding so you have to be very careful in such situation of course as you said you need to go and try to find out the extent of uh, the tumor but you have to have with some gentleness you cannot be like just taking and try to feel it and digging it out because it just goes on bleeding if it is if it is a, a malignant tumor also the 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 break in the capsule also occurs when you are handling so you have to be gentle and then you also go and see the other, other ovary you have to see the operability whether it is removable operable on op inoperable weather and in such circumstances you will find that the omentum is totally stuck up where there is a breach in the capsule or there is a, uh, a source of bleeding so you will find the intestines or omentum being stuck up have you seen such cases yeah, no sir yeah okay fine no no problem then what would you do now next uh, sir then we will uh, after uh, palpating and uh, in, after inspecting and palpating the intraabdominal organs then we will uh, uh, take out the uh, remove the tumor it is not like you press a button and the tumor comes out so uh, means if the uh, tumor is uh, limited to the ovary then uh, uh, in in I this patient i understood what you meant to say what what uh, what operation you will perform in such uh, sir uh, in this patient we will uh, go for to uh, uh, hysterectomy with a bilateral salpingo oophorectomy yes with what uh, uh, with intra please intra can you please uh, close your slides they are just uh, we, we we are living in the past please can you stop sharing your yes and i can't see you why are you hidden young man yes sir you are doing good i can say you have got 8 out of 10 by now maybe madam can add two more points yes, okay. <laughs> now now we now we see the ovarian tumor which has come in existence in front of us so madam we have at least 2 3 minutes what do you mean by yeah, optimal please you can yeah what do you mean by optimal cyto reduction uh ma'am optimal cyto reduction means uh, any residual uh, uh, there should be uh, less than 1 cm of any residual uh, tumor okay. in there okay. why 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 do why we want to do the optimal cyto reduction in the such patient ma'am to reduce the chance of recurrence Mm, survival uh, benefits for the survival benefits survival. also okay so now uh, uh, you need to trace the bowel do you need to trace the bowel or do you need to do further additional surgery apart from th with bso doctor uh, yes sir uh, we will go for intracolic uh, omentectomy and if there are adhesions uh, then uh, we have to go for that also please palpate the ascending colon the liver the omentum under surface of the uh, right and the left diaphragm hemi diaphragm you need also to see the palpation of i mean the the the, the stomach and finally the transverse colon spleen descending colon and the bladder and the peritoneum mm -hmm. how the systematic uh, 
sequential exploration of the organ has to be done and suspicious areas have to be biopsied biopsies required you are rightly said that you need to do an infracolic ideally uh, they also perform peritonectomy it is a very important surgical yeah, yeah. procedure so that you reduce the incidence of recurrence and such an ovarian tumor patients uh, with ca ma- with malignancy they come back with recurrence so uh, it is always preferable to do a peritonectomy and that starts from the beginning when you start opening the abdomen okay and what is the role of retroperitoneal lymph node sampling do you do in such cases uh, yes sir retroperitoneal lymph node sampling sir then in early stage uh, it is done uh, to see for microscopic metastasis okay now last question is about chemotherapy just uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy what would you suggest and how many cycles post operatively you would like to give this patient in early stage and in advanced stage cancers uh, so in early stage uh, cancer we will go for uh, adjuvant chemotherapy uh, which is platinum based carboplatin and paclitaxel are used uh, three weekly for six cycles and in cases of advanced uh, stage we have to go for neoadjuvant chemotherapy three cycles prior to uh, cytoreduction surgery and then we will go for interval uh, cytoreduction and then again three cycles of uh, chemotherapy very good and what is surveillance how will you go about surveillance when the patient becomes all right how what what uh, how would you do often the surveillance of such cases uh, so we will uh, keep the follow up of the patient three monthly for first two years uh then six monthly uh, uh for next three years and then annually thereafter uh, during each visit we will go for clinical examination ca uh, 125 levels and if needed ct scan can be done ct scan you cannot do every three month you need to do only ultrasound pelvis okay yes sir surveillance and uh, apart from ca 125 if you are suspecting any other pathology Uh, as per the microscopy which comes then you will have to do alpha fetoprotein hcg ldh level and ca125 if it is a plain epithelial tumor only two tumor markers are enough but if it is a highly malignant or a, a poor prognosis tumor as per the tnm classification then you need to do all the tumor markers and you need to evaluate every 3 monthly and 6 monthly as you suggest also you they need to do uh, a proper uh, per rectal examination per vaginal examination auscultation and if there is uh, uh, any history of patient having hemoptysis or there is malina or there is any other uh weight loss or any other symptoms where she has satiety uh, issues then we need to further evaluate her by doing even a ct thorax uh, thorax and ct abdomen but we cannot do every 6 monthly 6 month right madam any other question you want to ask uh, prognostic factor for the ovarian malignancy and one second is why the fertility case ratio is more for the ovarian malignancy there are two questions and then uh mom uh, the age of the patient uh, the health of the patient then uh, the uh, parity of the patient then uh, uh, how parity the stage... influences the prognosis mm. okay go ahead uh then mom stage uh, st- uh, stage of the tumor uh, grading of the tumor uh then histological type of histolo- okay. histological type okay then uh, brca uh, mutation presence of uh, brca mutation her to or new oncogene presence of her to or new her to or new oncogene and and diploidy and aploidy ah huh, diploidy and aploidy hmm. hmm. so which one is or oh, anything else cyto reduction if it is not optimal one Op- optimal huh. it also affect the survival of the patient survival. now tell me why the uh, fatality case ratio is more for the ovarian carcinoma I'm not um, telling. Yes. 
the recurrence uh, rate is more in ovarian carcinoma and it is rapidly uh, growing tumor no most of the ovarian patients are diagnosed at the late stage so late there stage. is no assess pre invasive condition as seen in the cases of carcinoma cervix and what other factors there is no effective screening effective method effective screening for this. methods and the symptom doesn't correlate with the size of the tumor tumor and cancer cells they are freely rotate in the peritoneal cavity these are the some of the factor that increases the fatality case ratio for the five year survival bata sakte ho so according to the stages mm, according uh, in stage 1 the five year survival rate is around 90% uh, in stage 2 okay, it is around 80% in okay. stage 3 it is around 30% and in stage 4 it is around 20% third is 50 to 60 and fourth is 17 20 around the same overall 45% what are the newer modalities apart from the surgery surgery and the chemotherapy what yes, are the newer modalities for the what are the new additions in the ovarian malignancy management newer drugs Um, we can add by C Zumab, uh, which are okay. targeted therapy, like human monoclonal antibodies. Uh, okay. They can increase the survival rate. Uh, okay. Further, uh, we can use uh, poly uh, adenophosphate ribosyl uh, inhibitor, uh, okay. like okay. olaparib and rucaparib. Okay. And immunotherapy and the gene therapy. Okay. and what is your opinion regarding the genetic testing in all the ovarian cancer patients mom uh, genetic testing should be done in all the uh, patients who are diagnosed with if they level carcinomas if they level ovarian carcinoma right. because around 40% of the brca associated ovarian cancers they are not having the family history History. we only assess the family history and then we go for the uh, we think genetic for the hereditary testing. cancer mm-hmm. actually no but in 40% of the cases we don't have such type of history yes over from my side sir yeah so i think uh, what is uh, i think you have uh, come out with very uh, flying colors and uh, really appreciate all the answers yes. you have done yes yes thank you sir and uh, you are going to uh, perceive uh, fellowship in gynae oncology in india if, <laughs> if you are really interested uh, because it's a very uh, uh, important subject still there are yes. who are dying of ovarian cancer it's a fourth important cause of death uh, of mortality in young uh, in our uh, women especially in post menopausal and i have seen also in uh, quite early reproductive ages also so mala khup bara vatla aaj nagpur la mi alo ani dr sushma ani tanche sahakari dr secretary madam pragati 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 also priyanka then there is uh, many of them prachi dikshit i can see mukesh bang sir is going to take a lecture and uh, it was really nice i think uh, sushma madam i missed you in figo uh, yes yes nahi i couldn't come here yeah. <laughs> uh, actually uh, i couldn't come because you know the main my conference is there carnival is to be carnival so i am busy with so many preparations and other also other things are also there every year you do uh, carnival but we missed you in the fashion show of the paris <laughs> milan and then switzerland but i am sure Uh, your carnival is more important as how bollywood is important for mumbai and i'm sure yeah. uh, you have made a name in uh, not only india but also in other country yeah, yeah and, four international faculties are coming actually yes madam i know your enthusiasm and i am uh, really happy to see my colleague uh, dr uh, nikit right yes nikita sir nikita vijay Nikita. Nikita, but Nikita. you are both a very really fantastic examiner, and Abhijit, you are a very good student. I was yeah, listening you. really, so it was wonderful. The, everything was going so nicely, and yes. so practical points you were telling. Yes, and I think that's more important. And 
uh, it is really I'm I'm feeling very happy. I have made some slides. Uh, if you permit me, I will forward uh, to the president sure. and sure. Uh, for their benefit uh, because I have one student, Dr. Shraddha Rao. She met yes, me sir. this morning. She has done from NKP Salve. Yes, sir. She is our student, sir. Shraddha yes. Rao. Yes, and she told me, sir, uh, that uh, 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 your lecture is there and it is there also in the group. And I, I we attend it uh, on Thursdays, first and third uh, Thursdays every every month. And I said, now all our Mumbai student and also Navi Mumbai Thana student, I have told all of them in our groups also that they are now not only attend our uh, PG crash course, which we take annually and the AFG RAND symposium, but Dr. Sushma, now we are also going to attend your Thursday clinics. Thank you. Thank of, you very much. Of postgraduate star. And I'm yes. really, very happy. That every, every time really we are getting very good response of PG students. Yes, madam. And and they start asking when is the next one like this is the first and the third Thursday. So, so uh, it is very important as consultants and as teachers that we encourage our students and we are very happy and proud that all of you are doing very well. And I wish all the best to all of you. Thank you so much. Yeah. We'll have one photograph. Yes. But uh, Corona people, please, uh, everyone is there. Please open your windows. We'll have a one group photograph. Chief, sir, Tanushree, ma'am, please join. Dr. Tanushree. Dr. Ashish Zararia. Tanushri. Hello, ma'am. Hello, Mukesh, sir. Hello. Yeah, hello. Welcome, uh, welcome, Dr. Mukesh. Thank you, thank you, Sushma, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. I think I am I am giving 100% to Abhijit because he used Bevesizumab properly. He, he <laughs> used the word name properly. <laughs> More than that, I am giving him 100% marks for it. So, See, Abhijit, everyone is appreciating you. Thank you. <laughs> you, you Abhijit, Abhishek, uh, Abhijit, well done. And it's really uh, wonderful hearing you and uh, experts were mind-blowing. I mean, I was... I just had, uh, and I just could hear the half part of it, but it was really, really very uh, fruitful and uh, very con beautifully conducted. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Corona people, done. Vashishta, who is there? Ruchir Ruchi is there, no? Ruchir? He's mute. He's there? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have already taken and put it in the group. Okay. okay. So <laughs> Everybody is smiling now constantly when you are saying. <laughs> Priyanka. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Niranjan. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Niranjan, so for being here. Thank you. Thanks Bye. a lot. So we would like to have you again and again. Yes, I will come every two months, one month. I Next love time as a speaker, so okay? Much, Next time as a speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Niranjan sir and uh, Nikita ma'am, uh, that we had very informative, knowledgeable discussion. And uh, as usual, uh, uh, sir had given her eight out of ten marks. So we need to ask her appreciation. Two from now. my side, ten. <laughs> ten out of ten. <laughs> uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, now, uh, without wasting again our time, uh, we will move our uh, second section. That is. Uh, that is uh, on ovarian cancer, how to treat and update. So I think uh, oh, yeah. I, am the, I am the only physician medical oncologist sitting here along with all of you surgeons. So oh, if surgical part, I think you know better than me. I am the one who is going to tell you about the medical part. I will not go into brief about the basic introduction, which everyone knows. And uh, second most common gynae cancer, most common gynae cancer related death fifth leading cause and everything we you know and the questions are already done. So the lifetime risk of the developing ovarian cancer is 1.3%. One in 80 women will be diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Risk factors, I think, sir and madam has already uh, taken a dig uh, with Abhijit and asked everything. So the important part which he asked uh, to Abhijit was BRCA testing. The red flags uh, for cancer susceptibility is a BRCA1 and 2. 
the the important factors are multiple family members with ovarian or breast cancer age of onset of breast cancer younger than 50 years of age premenopausal bilateral oh, breast cancer both breast and ovarian cancer Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry and male breast cancer. There are some other factors also, but these are the important, uh, important red flags for checking the BRCA testing. So, the what is the lifetime risk of cancers? It is not only uh, BRCA one and two; it is also MMR because in endometrial CA there is a, a importance of MMR. And nowadays, the guideline has shown to use immunotherapy if there is a, a DMMR, like a, a deficient MMR, uh, is there in the endometrial CA. You can directly use immunotherapy in these cases. So now, in all these uh, genet uh, genetic malignancies, we always uh, do uh, gynecological malignancies. We always do uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, and MMR testing. So this is one important point here. So FIGO staging already uh, all of you know. I think better than me. In short, for uh, the PG students. Excuse me, uh, sir. Can we, excuse me. Can we just ask a person to just. Introduce chairpersons of the today's session, your session, before starting. Your... Uh, yes, yes, I think um, uh, that part <laughs> Just... was left, but Mukesha is because out there. Mukesh has Ashish started and Dr. Think... Tanushri are no, no, no. there. Chair, please... Chairpersons are very important. I myself introduced both of them. So one yes, is Dr. Ashish Jararia. I know Just him very well. Favor, one minute. Priyanka, Dr. Priyanka. Yes, ma'am. Uh, please, uh, just chair... introduce chairpersons. Yes, ma'am. Our chairperson, sir, uh, Dr. Ashish Zararia, sir. Sir is associate professor at GMC Nagpur. Sir, having more than 20 publications at national and international level. Uh, sir uh, is a member of advisory committee to Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India for developing and expanding obstetric ICU and HDU at facilities all over the India. Now, our second chairperson is Dr. Tanushri Jain, ma'am. Uh, ma'am is currently working as NCI Nagpur. Ma'am having um, uh, her specialty in uh, oncogynecology. Uh, ma'am is very much academic and interested in her oncosurgeries. And she is also too much interested in her oncofertility yeah. also. Uh, so now uh, yeah. I would like to request Ashish sir to introduce yeah. the Mukesh Bang, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, just slides also. Just yes, uh, can you just here to just stop sharing your slide so they will share the slides? So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Mukesh Bang to all of you. Uh, he's a great friend of mine and uh, he works uh, at uh, Alexis Hospital as well as uh, uh, nearby GMC, our own um, uh, cancer hospital. And um, uh, he's an intensivist also. and uh, uh, he was awarded uh, the best oncologist of Maharashtra in 2021. So that's so creditable, Mukesh. And uh, I, I hope uh, OBG Wayne will be benefited uh, with your inputs. So over to you, Mukesh. Thank you. Thank you. you, can you. Start I now. think I start. So can I go ahead with this slide only now? So yes, yes. This yes. Yes, sure, okay. sure. please, please. Sure. You can start from wherever thank you left. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the, the basic about uh, staging is not to complicate ourselves. To have a stage one tumor limited to one or both ovaries. Uh, stage two tumor involves one or both ovaries with disease confined to pelvis. Stage three tumor spread outside the pelvis to the peritoneal cavity or lymph nodes. And stage four is the distant metastasis. So... So why it is important to have a histological subtyping? Because the, the cellular origin varies among ovarian cancer subtype. As you can see in the slide, if there is surface epithelial, then you have a high-grade serous carcinoma, low-grade serous carcinoma. And if it is a endometriosis related, then you have a endometrial uh, carcinoma or clear cell carcinoma. Or if you have an endocervicosis type, then you have a mucidus carcinoma. That's the reason the subtyping of ovarian cancer is important because there is a prognostication to it. As you can see in the slide, the PFS and OS, that is the progression-free survival and overall survival are lower in mucinous or clear cell histology than serous or endometrial ovarian cancer. That is the reason we always suggest to do a biopsy, not to treat any patient based on only FNSE. Sometimes we see the report that uh, it's uh, the fluid is positive for malignant cells or fluid is positive uh, for cancer cells or atypical cells and uh, the consultant starts with chemotherapy or surgery. It is not like that. The subtyping of the ovarian malignancy is very important because the survival benefit 
and the treatment protocol changes with each malignancy subtypes. So what is the initial management? Uh, basically, the most important part in ovarian cancer is with the gynae oncologist. When the woman presents with ovarian cancer related symptoms, history examination, which we already discussed, and when we know, we, when we suspect it's ovarian malignancy, we try to do first clinical examination, ultrasonography, CA 125 imaging, as we discussed in the previous uh, uh, session about uh, CT scan and PET scan, and then automatically PET scan for the metastatic workup. And the first patient, my first choice is always send the patient to gynae oncologist. Let him, let him or her evaluate and let them give me the call whether they can do optimal cytoreduction or not. So if there is no risk assessment, then automatically uh, we do average risk of ovarian cancer screening. And if we feel there is a family history or personal history, then automatically you should not do directly BRCA testing. You should do genetic counseling first before sending for the BRCA or genetic testing. So it is very important. Nowadays, we talk about sending the sample, but once it comes positive, all family gets shattered. So automatically genetic counseling is very important before uh, doing any genetic testing. As uh, already discussed in the previous uh, session, so when we have a suspe suspicious palpable mass or floating in the abdomen, we do usual initial evaluation as already sir has told. And based on clinical stages, we decide. As uh, ma'am was, Nikita, Nikita madam was asking the fertility desired 1A, 1B, automatically we do the salpingophorectomy plus comprehensive staging. In stage 1A to 4, surgical candidate, optimal site production is likely. Automatically, we want gynae oncologist to come in a picture and do the surgery. Only the picture for us as a medical oncologist is if the patient have a poor surgical, if the, if the patient is a poor surgical candidate or if the gynecological oncologist is saying that let's, it's less likely that they can go for optimal site production, there the role of new adjuvant chemotherapy comes. So one more scenario, many times working in a tertiary care center, we find sometimes the patient has been operated outside with some, uh, some mass removed and then it turned out to be ovarian cancer or uh, a malignancy proven histopathology, then we automatically ask the gynecologist oncologist again to see, check for all the uh, markers and scanning. And we always want them to do surgical staging considering the previous scenario. So and this is the, what is the principle of surgery? I think you people know better than me, but what the guideline NCCN guideline says, if, if the patient is a newly diagnosed invasive ovarian cancer confined to ovary, on entering the abdomen, aspiration of ascites or peritoneal lava should be done for peritoneal cytological examination. And all peritoneal surfaces should be visualized and the biopsies should be done and the BSO hysterectomy should be performed, infracolic omentectomy should be done, parotic lymph node dissection should be done in early stages. And the main important point is the preferred method of dissecting pelvic lymph nodes is bilateral limo of lymph nodes overlying and anterior to the common iliac vessels, overlying and medial to the external iliac vessels, overlying and medial to the hypogastric vessels, and from the obturate photo as the minimum anterior to the obturator now. This is, I think, I, I think you people know, but this is one point for me, it was more so that's the reason I am telling this point. So the primary treatment. So as we discussed before, the primary treatment automatically is uh, uh, the surgery, depending upon the stage, fertility desire, we decide for the surgical part. And if the patient is having bulky disease or poor surgical candidate, then patient turn, uh, is uh, referred to us for the new adjuvant chemotherapy. <laughs> Sorry. So maximum surgical debulking and platinum chemotherapy is the cornerstone of primary treatment. Aim of surgery to confirm diagnosis, define extent of disease spread, and restrict all visible tissue. As Abhijit was telling, what is optimal cytoreduction? Previously, it was less than one centimeter, but now it is no microscopic visible disease should be there. So recent, there was a recent randomized trial with, which investigated whether initial diagnostic laparoscopy could prevent futile uh, primary cytotoxic surgery by identifying patients with advanced ovarian cancer who cannot be optimally debulked. So 10% of the patient in the diagnostic laparoscopy group had futile laparotomy versus 39% of the patients in the primary cytotoxic surgery. That means if you have a doubt about optimal site reduction, it is better to do diagnostic laparoscopy and see uh, whether uh, you can consider for new adjuvant chemotherapy and then consider for interval site reduction. 
Bevacizumab plus chemotherapy followed by single agent Bevacizumab is recently approved for upfront treatment of ovarian cancer. So stages we already discussed about cytoreduction reduction goal. Why we need uh, Nikita Madam already asked the same question. Why we want optimal cytoreduction? reduction? Because automatically it improves the overall survival. You can see here if the residual disease is more than 10 uh, mm, the overall survival is 17 months. If it is 1 to 10 mm, 32 months. And if there is a complete cytoreduction, reduction, it goes to 56 months, like three to four years. So definitely optimal cytoreduction reduction is a goal which we want. The second question which the uh, examiner asked to Abhijit was with, what is the role of lymphadenectomy? I think you surgeon know better. I think Stanushri also can elaborate on this. Uh, lymphadenectomy in resected lymph node negative advanced ovarian cancer. In patients with advanced ovarian cancer, upfront surgery, achieving macroscopic complete site reduction is a part of curative treatment standard of care. Randomized trial of systemic pelvic and parotid lymphadenopathy demonstrated significant improvement in progression to survival, but not overall survival in patients with little or no residual disease. So the current prospect to randomized trial, Lyon trial investigated the PFS and OF benefit of lymph node dissection in patients with, you remember this, in patients with lymph node negative, clinically, radiologically, advanced ovarian cancer following macroscopic complete resection. So this is a Lyon study uh, where the criteria was adult patients with suspected or proven stage 2b to 4 epithelial ovarian cancer, macroscopic complete resection, and clinically and radiologically regative pelvic and parotid lymph nodes. So whether to do lymph lymphadenectomy or not. So the conclusion was in patients with advanced ovarian cancer, uh, uh, the median OS was 67.2 months, five-year overall survival was 55.9% and median PFS was 22.5 months. So the conclusion was, uh, the systemic lymph node dissection not recommended in this patient population if there is clinically and radiologically no lymphadenopathy in advanced ovarian cancer. So let's come uh, to the my, pa my part of this area now. So the simple to remember for the PG students, if there is a stage 1A, 1B, grade 1, no need of chemotherapy. Grade 2 endometrioid, high grade serous carcinoma, any other histopathology, you need a chemotherapy. Previously, there was a data of using three cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy in uh, early uh, early stage uh, tumors. But nowadays, we always prefer to use six cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy, which involves paclitaxel and carboplatin. So you can see here, stage 1A, 1B, excluding grade 1, grade 2 endometroid, grade 3 endometroid, any high-grade serous carcinoma, you need to give chemotherapy. And stage 1, stage onward, automatically, you need to give chemotherapy. So 1A, 1B, grade 1. No chemotherapy other than all other areas you need to give adjuvant chemotherapy. So uh, the chemotherapy definitely has evolved from last uh, many years. Previously, it was adriamycin, cyclophosphamide, different drugs combination were used. Then the first came, important drug came combination was cisplatin and paclitaxel 24-hour infusion. And that cisplatin, paclitaxel improved uh, overall survival of the patient. Later, it turned to three-hour infusion of cisplatin and paclitaxel, automatically it has also improved the overall survival. Now, based on GOG trials, now we have carboplatin and paclitaxel as a standard drug of choice uh, with a minimum side effect as an adjuvant and in metastatic setting uh, uh, ovarian cancer. So, now again, we go back to the, uh, the area where new adjuvant therapy is involved. So, gynecologist has seen the patient and they told that it's a poor surgical candidate for optimal site reduction. So automatically patient comes to me for new adjunct chemotherapy and all ovarian malignancy, epithelial ovarian malignancy, we do uh, uh, germline uh, testing. The difference between germline and somatic, germline you can do on the blood, somatic you have to do on the tissue. So automatically we do new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by response assessment and then decide for interval site reduction and adjuvant therapy. So the question again asked to Abhijit was, this was a clear, this slide is important for the PG students. The current indications of new adjuvant chemotherapy in ovarian cancer. First of all, for me as a medical oncologist, the gynae oncologist has said, okay, you go for new adjuvant, that is the first indication for me. So otherwise, uh, the theoretical purpose, poor performance status, medical condition, optimal site reduction is less likely. The CT findings with diaphragmatic disease more than two centimeter, 
extra peritoneal disease like lung or brain metastasis, multiple liver metastasis, involvement of porta hepatis, pancreatic head and body metastasis, suprarenal parotic lymphadenopathy. So these are few of the uh, CT imaging findings uh, which tell us to go for neoadjuvant chemotherapy than directly going for primary cytotherapy surgery. So uh, this also has been quoted in EORTC and Coros trial, but the final conclusion, what they have quoted, you can see here, EORTC exploratory analysis showed that primary surgery benefited in stage 3C patients with metastatic tumors less than 45 mm size, and neoadjuvant chemotherapy benefited in stage 4 patients with metastatic tumor more than 45 mm size. So, and JCOG also has shown the non-inferiority of neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by interval debulking surgery to primary debulking surgery followed by chemotherapy. So both have both this trial have quoted that if the poor performance status and what the previous criteria I told, you should go for neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery. So the guidelines, as we just now I told, if the if the recommendation for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, you should go for neoadjuvant therapy, and uh, then that you have to decide. Uh, based on the patient performance status, you have to decide for the chemotherapy backbone and then give three to four cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by cycles because now cycles, sometimes you can go up to six cycles if the patient has a good response. Uh, but usually in our practice, we try to give three to four cycles and then hand over to the uh, gynion team to, uh, to, under, uh, to a process for interval cytoproductive surgery. So drug reaction, I think this is not much important for you, but because the platinum drugs are very notorious to cause infusion reactions and allergic reactions. So we have a protocol recommendation uh, how to uh, treat these infusion reactions. These are very common with platinum. That is the reason we always give steroids along with all antihistaminics. And uh, uh, we have to be very careful when you use platinum drugs uh, to, to the patients. So the high level overview of frontline treatment. So this is again a revision, surgical candidate and high likelihood of surgery, surgeon. Then chemotherapy, genetic evaluation. Then comes maintenance therapy. This I will be discussing later. And if the patient is a poor surgical candidate, new adjunct chemotherapy, three to, as I told, three to four cycles, and then surgical uh, debulking and then adjuvant therapy. So now we have come in oncology like all malignancies we are trying to see whether we can keep it as a maintenance therapy and we can make it this disease as a chronic and a curative disease just like a prostate cancer even if it's a stage 4 prostate cancer we have a treatment which can keep the patient for 5 7 10 8 years now in breast cancer if hormone positive breast cancers are there we have patients who are on 7 8 years of therapy even if it is a stage 4 disease like that we are trying to see in ovarian cancer Automatically, there are multiple lines of therapy in ovarian cancer and uh, uh, usually we try to push the patient even in stage 4 for 3 or 4 years uh, with the uh, various treatment options available like primary cytoreduction, interval cytoreduction, secondary cytoreduction. We have different chemotherapy options. We have targeted therapy options. We have PARP inhibitors. So many things we have. So now similar thing we are doing in ovarian cancer. See, we have done an optimal cytoreduction chemotherapy. The, the two points are there, either to observe the patient or to give the maintenance therapy. If you observe the patient, automatically we know the patient will relapse. But if you give a maintenance therapy to this patient, the, there will be a slow growth and the minimal de uh, detectable threshold will be there. And so that we can prolong the uh, relapse of the patient. That's the reason in now all malignancies in stage 4 diseases, we are trying to keep some or the other maintenance therapy so that to prolong the uh, relapse of the disease. So the, what are the advent of maintenance therapy? The previously it was uh, paclitaxel uh, used to continue as a maintenance, but it couldn't talk, patient couldn't tolerate. They started with bevacizumab. That is the first line. Now it is approved in the first line, new adjuvant, adjuvant and metastatic setting and as a maintenance drug. Then it is followed by olaparib. This is a PARP inhibitor. And uh, again, the, the treatment evolved. Then the come niraparib, then rucaparib. And again, there are different uh, data of using first line BRCA mutation, which started from 2018 as per the solo data of using olaparib as a maintenance therapy in first line a metastatic breast uh, ovarian cancer. So now I, I told you, see, previously we were happy with this combination of paclitaxel cisplatin. 
then the combination came with pakli carbo we were happy uh, this combination is working now we have a triplet combination of using pakli taxel carboplatin and target is maybe anything you can choose either bevacizumab or parp inhibitor so now right now with the present situation we are happy with this combination so but as the time goes we know there will be new and new modality of treatment which will come in a picture and which will help us to and guide us uh, and add more treatment uh, to the present uh, uh, combination of chemotherapies and targeted therapies now immunotherapy is there now other pap inhibitors are there other tumor markers are there and so that's the reason we have different targeted therapies available now so as i told bevacizumab is added to the frontline therapy uh, in gog trials i not say about trials here because it is too much of trial for other people than medical oncologist so uh, based on the different trials bevacizumab is added as a frontline therapy and it continued as a maintenance therapy which improves the progression free survival so the pap inhibitors so the pap inhibitors have 50 years on from pap inhibitor discovery you can see from 1960s it has started and the evolution was there initially it was uh, it was uh, for breast cancer and then further progression happened more in ovarian cancer and now it is approved as a first line maintenance therapy people may be asking why not uh, if the braca positive is there why not we can start from uh, with chemotherapy but if we add with chemotherapy it it gives too much of toxicity if if someone has used pap inhibitor they will understand what i am saying because this pap inhibitor cause pancytopenia they drop too much of hemoglobin wbc platelet even the dose of 300 mg bd of onaparib it is very difficult to tolerate by the patient so automatically we start with a lesser dose and we try to see whether the patient will tolerate or not so we have come across this pap inhibitors are a wonderful drug i have few of my patients who are on pap inhibitors they are doing well i have one my, one of my known uh, gynecologist i cannot name but uh, she was treated with uh, all treatment and she came braca positive she has finished 2 years of olaparib and now since 2021 she is fine and she is not on treatment and absolutely fine so definitely these drugs works and uh, i know sometimes the other people say uh, medical oncologists say fancy thing impo very high class drugs very costly drugs but when we see all these results now automatically we always want these drugs to be used in practice and to see so approximate 50% of high grade serous ovarian cancer have alteration in hr repair genes so these are different genes so what we talk about hr deficient hr product possibly hr deficient hr proficient and other so definitely in this scenario uh, definitely the the pap inhibitor works so hr deficient and possibly hr deficient so how we check it so nowadays we have hrd panel that is human homologous recombinant deficiency panel sometimes there is a confusion what is braca what is hrr and what is hrd see braca is uh, divided into germline and somatic germline means it can be done from your blood somatic you have to do from the tissue that is a basic braca gene that is only single two genes we check the hrr gene test your mutations pathologic mutations in the uh, hrr genes but the hrd panel takes care of your genomic aberrations also so that's the reason hrd includes your hrr also and your braca also so if the patient doesn't have a cost issue definitely hrd uh, we always suggest hrd panel for all uh, ovarian malignancy serous ovarian malignancy i'll show you one report also this is one of my patient who had low grade serous cystadenocarcinoma involving ori you can see here the braca mutation is negative but the patient is hrd positive so now a guideline has suggested to use pap inhibitor if the patient is hrd positive even if braca is negative why i will go back here you can see even if the braca is there even if it is negative there are some other gene uh, mutations which uh, which can be targeted with pap inhibitors that's the reason even if braca is negative but hrd panel is positive you you uh, you should consider pap inhibitor and nowadays the cost of pap inhibitor has gone down from 1.5 lakh to 50 60000 per month so now at least a few of the people are uh, affording and using the pap inhibitor so the evolutionary milestone i am not going to the trials as i told already bevacizumab followed by olaparib now there is a data of using olaparib along with bevacizumab as a maintenance therapy if we have used bevacizumab as a first line uh, the treatment option along with paclitaxel so what is the final proposed 
systemic algorithm. So you test for somatic of germline BRCA, and then you decide for new adjuvant chemotherapy versus primary debulking surgery, and then you decide about addition of bevacizumab to paclitaxel, and then addition of PARP inhibitors. So automatically you can see the sequence here: surgery, chemotherapy, addition of bevacizumab required or not. Why it is important? See, in my practice, I don't use bevacizumab in new adjuvant setting because first two cycles you use third cycle again you have to stop because the surgeons uh, will be uh, taking care of the surgery and bevacizumab is contraindicated uh, because you cannot uh, do surgery six weeks uh, uh, before stopping of bevacizumab because it is a vascular endothelial growth factor uh, inhibitor so automatically it causes bleeding so bevacizumab has to be stopped six weeks before planning for surgery so automatically you are missing the third cycle after surgery Again, fourth cycle you cannot use, then you have to use in the fifth and sixth cycle. So, automatically, where there is intention of interval cytoprotective surgery, you should avoid using bevacizumab. When surgery is done, whether it is the R1 dissection or whatever, then after fifth or sixth cycle, you can consider using bevacizumab and continue as a maintenance drug. And based on your uh, germline and BACA or HRD panel, you can add PAP inhibitors. So, genetic testing, current guidelines. What are the current guidelines? So, as I already told, germline testing for BRCA1 and BRCA2 recommended for all women at diagnosis, regardless of family history of ovarian or breast cancer. If the patient is having ovarian malignancy, serous epithelial ovarian malignancy, you should do BRCA testing. Somatic testing also. Then clear cell mucinous or endometrial ovarian cancer. The other tumor marker like DMMR should be checked because there is a target for it now as immunotherapy. So, now you can see here. The NCCN guidelines are difficult to understand for the uh, other people. So I will go by the flow chart. So you see here, the patient is diagnosed with a treatment, uh, diagnosed with ovarian malignancy stage 2 to 4, treatment done. Whether bevacizumab or use or not, if not used, you check the BRCA. If BRCA is wild type and there is a complete response, there is a still data of using niraparib as a maintenance therapy. If germline BRCA mutation is positive, even if the patient is CR or PR, you can still consider Olaparib as a maintenance therapy in ovarian cancer if germline mutation is positive. If, the, if we have used bevacizumab as a primary treatment along with chemotherapy, if BRCA is negative and proficient, you can continue only bevacizumab. And if germline or somatic BRCA mutations are positive, you should consider bevacizumab along with Olaparib. And there is a very good data of this combination. And I have patients that they are doing well. So definitely this uh, combination is working and doing well. So what are the current treatment options? The, these are the various treatment options. I will not go into detail for the PG students or for other people. Uh, I think paclitaxel, carboplatin, gemcitabin and lipodop. These are the important drug combination which everyone should know. The targeted therapy as I told, bevacizumab, olaparib, brucaparib, niraparib, pembrolizumab as I told for MSI, or DMMR positive patients. So the NCCN guideline has again mentioned the different chemotherapy regimen. Uh, uh, for mucinous carcinoma, definitely we try to prefer um, the colonic regimen. But it's not like that every time we use colonic, we can use paclitaxel. But colonic being a mucinous carcinoma, we prefer to use a colonic regimen there. Otherwise, in all other malignancies, paclitaxel is a standard backbone chemotherapy regimen. So what is the follow-up recommendation? As a, an, uh, the uh, sir was mentioning, examiner sir was mentioning the follow physical examination every two to uh, four months for two years and then three to six months for three years and then annual physical plus pelvic examination. As sir was telling, every time there is no need of uh, CT scan, you can just do CA 125 markers, CBC uh, and uh, the other chem chemistry profile, SOS if required sonography. And if there is a doubt, then you can consider for CT scans. So final comes to the ASCO guidelines. What are the ASCO guidelines are telling about all this? See, we have come to the conclusion. We have finished with our part of ovarian malignancy. We have started with new adjuvant. Cytoreduction surgery is done by the gynecologist. oncologist Adjuvant chemotherapy received and patient is on bevacizumab and she came BRCA positive. So I have started her on bevacizumab plus olaparib as a maintenance therapy. That's all. So that is a completion treatment plan for ovarian malignancy. Now, what are the recommendations? What the recommendation ASCO recommendation says? The question first was given by the, this, these questions were given by the gynecologist or gynecologist basically to the ASCO team. 
So what clinical evaluation should be performed in all women with suspected or newly diagnosed stage 3, C or 4? The recommendations were should be evaluated by gynae oncologist prior to initiation of therapy to determine whether they are candidate for PCL. This was I was telling. For me, sorry, ovarian cancer. First, I will call gynae oncologist tell, can you see this patient? And what is your take on this? Whether you can do primary cytotoxic surgery or not. <clears throat> if the surgeon says, okay, I can do primary cytotoxic surgery, I am happy. I am more than happy. So my load is less. The second recommendation is a primary clinical evaluation should include a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis with oral and intraventral contrast and chest imaging should be done. See, many times I see people, uh, the surgeons, they do only CT abdomen, but they forget to do CT chest. In ovarian malignancy, the pleural fluid positivity changes the stage. So you should always check, uh, always do chest imaging to assess uh, the uh, staging and uh, for the surgical dissection. So, with the second question is which patient, which patient and disease factors should be utilized as criteria for identifying patients who are not suitable for primary cytoreductive surgery. This we discuss. So, the recommendation says women who have high perioperative risk profile or low likelihood of achieving cytoreductive to less than 1 cm, ideally to no visible disease. This I was telling. Ideally, now it is no microscopic visible, visible disease should receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So, how do neoadjuvant chemotherapy and PCS compare with respect to progression-free survival, overall survival and perioperative morbidity and mortality in women with newly diagnosed stage 3C or 4 epithelial cancer who are fit for a primary cytoreduction and have potential resectable disease? So, for women who are fit for PCS with potential resectable disease, either neoadjuvant chemotherapy or PCS may be offered based on data from phase 3 RCTs that demonstrate that neoadjuvant chemotherapy is non-inferior to PCS with respect to progression-free survival and overall survival. The main factor of neoadjuvant chemotherapy is associated with less peri and post-operative morbidity and mortality and shorter hospitalization. But PCS may offer superior survival in selected patients. So here, as we discussed before, neoadjuvant criteria we should remember and we should see and then accordingly, we should decide whether new adjuvant chemotherapy or primary cytotherapy surgery. So, the other, uh, I'll go to the question four. Clinical evaluation, this we already discussed. The preferred chemotherapy regimen, as already told, paclitaxel, uh, paclitaxel and carboplatin. The, does the timing of internal cytotoxin or the number of chemotherapy cycles after internal cytotoxin affect the safety or efficacy of the treatment? RCT is tested, surgery followed by Three or four cycles of chemotherapy is women who had a response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy or stable disease. As I was telling, there are three or four cycles. Internal cytotoxin surgery should be performed after less than or four cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy with women who have a response to chemotherapy or stable disease. So, what are the treatment options for patients with progressive disease or neoadjuvant chemotherapy? Then automatically we know that they have a poor prognosis and then we have to use the uh, refractory regimens, uh, alternative chemotherapy regimen. Either we have to do the molecular profiling to see whether we are missing something molecular target and put the patient on clinical trial. So at the end, the summary of uh, ovarian cancer in a brief uh, way is in early stage surgery followed by adjuvant chemotherapy as per histology, stage 2 to 4 surgery, excluding patient for new adjuvant chemotherapy, excluding stage 1A and 1B grade 1 endometroid, Adjuvant chemotherapy is for all with paclitaxel and carboplatin for six cycles. Query role of lymphadenectomy in advanced disease if nodes are not involved radiologically or clinically. Stage 3 to 4 maintenance therapy with bevacizumab and or PARP inhibitor depending upon the BRCA mutations. And now we always do biomarker testing including BRCA, MSI to be checked in all patients with ovarian cancer. So now previously we know we were happy with Brahmas, the one it has a huge way and we were happy, very much happy, but we always want more and more. In oncology, we have learned one thing, this is less, we want more. This is less, we want more. Just like after Brahmastra 1, we want now Brahmastra part 2. Similarly, we want more and more drugs to see whether we can cure and we can increase the survival of the patient. Same thing is happening with ovarian cancer. Now, we have immunotherapy 
as a new adjuvant pembrolizumab app in all solid malignancy if the patient is msi high or dmmr so in all dmmr or msi high patients you can consider new adjuvant pembrolizumab app and see the response so now that's the reason in all malignancy we should do msi testing to see whether we can consider new adjuvant pembrolizumab app this is very fancy to say uh, immunotherapy but it has its own cost because it costs near about 1.5 to 2 lakh if, even if the pap program we use and uh, uh, not all patients are affordable for pembrolizumab lab that's the reason sometimes we don't do msi if the patient is not affordable but treatment guideline always suggest to do msi testing in all solid malignancies to consider for new adjuvant pembrolizumab but this is a very costly drug but i have few patients on pembrolizumab and they are doing well so for that so sometimes i work for a large multinational we are looking for a world class expert in digital this is what the people uh, patients people or uh, the uh, person says so then i say i am your man but i am not cheap because the some drugs are very costly drugs like if you talk about bevacizumab olaparib pembrolizumab these are very costly drugs and definitely uh, they are included uh, these drugs are included in the basic treatment uh, portfolio of ovarian cancer so thank you very much the best thing in life are actually really expensive thank you very much uh, thank you mukesh sir for such a valuable talks on a topic of management of ovarian tumor now uh, i will hand it over to dr tanushri jain ma'am to conclude the session so Okay, so I would say this was a very, really very comprehensive presentation, and I really enjoyed it for the simple reason that even being a medical oncologist, you realize the importance of surgery and ovarian cancer. So that is one point I really appreciate. Uh, I would just uh, like to add upon here that uh, whatever trials which showed uh, equal survival in NACT versus primary, they are basically all for three C four, which we conveniently forget. Ascites, peritoneal disease, and the straight way the patient goes for new adjuvant. So that is something uh, I would like to press upon for the students. Uh, hereditary point is very important for our patients. Uh, but I would like to ask you. I understand the complete importance of BRCA. But do you think MMR has got so much of significance, at least for time being, in ovary as compared to endometrial? I mean, in endometrial we have a very clear cut benefit. We are going for all patients. But ovary, I think we need to wait because it's a very small percentage. I think would come up with that MMR deficiency. Yes, I'll so, tell you. I have an example of one colonic patient. See, yeah, MMR guideline colonic. came for colonic also. Uh, I think in two thousand nineteen or eighteen or nineteen somewhere. Uh, we checked one of the patient at that time, and uh, we told uh, that uh, see, uh, you have finished first line of therapy, and uh, he has a metastatic disease including lung. liver and the primary disease and the patient uh, i i explained him that see now this is the target we have and you if you don't have a cost issue you can start with pembrolizumab yeah. at that time when the guideline were not there and i started with uh, uh, the third line fourth line setting they were saying if you don't have any option you use this but the patient is still alive and patient take patient took two years of pembrolizumab So, so similarly what we have realized not talking about guidelines but what i want to stress here is that 60% of colonic 40% of endometrial and 6 to 15% of ovary so that is yeah, the that, difference that so probably wherever, uh, wherever we have wherever you a, get a target yes. i appreciate but when we are not doing the basic braca testing i think we that is another like, second step yeah yes that is what you Now, we need to stress upon that we do yes, braca yes. and etra then we can definitely go to that i agree to your point uh, also i would nowadays like to, uh, mmr also done in 3 or 4000 4000 5000 only yes so we are doing it uh, for all endometrium definitely yes, yes. definitely i agree to your point uh, uh, i also want to uh, want you to uh, i mean highlight here that for low grade borderline and uterus tumors don't you think that uh, chemotherapy we know they are mainly chemo refractory tumors and we yes. many times uh, don't consider them as seriously as yes yes definitely. because we think these are low grade and borderline low grade. so why to worry but when they come with advanced this is like i get so many stage 3 borderline when this is something that so i think uh, 
as uh, I mean, organic residents should understand the importance of these tumors because they are not going to be chemo responsive. So only surgery is going to help, and that can involve anything starting from peritonectomy to bowel resection because that is only going to work. Because even if I I had a splenic mass tumor uh, with a low grade tumor, so that can happen. Um, uh, uh, fourth thing. <laughs> I would. Uh, I'm not such a fan of bevacizumab. Of course, you can understand as a surgeon, it causes a lot of difficulty. That's the reason I gave 100 percent marks to Abhijit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you gave, but I would. Uh, but one thing is for sure, it's it's got a PFS benefit, but no OS benefit. Nah, I no think. See, in all malignancies, in, not in ovarian, in all malignancies, I have seen bevacizumab. If you see yes. all trials in all malignancies, it gives benefit of four to six months, not more than that. That is a PFS. Yeah, but benefit. quality of life matters. So yes, I agree to that, your that, point. That's the reason we give. Okay. Uh, you right, rightly pointed out the lion trial. Uh, before we go to it, I would also like to stress upon that uh, one thing that uh, organic residents also should understand that para aortic lymph nodes are the primary nodal basin for ovary and not pelvic. So many times I see that pelvic lymphadenectomy is done and not para aortic. So for early stage, 30% of high grade serous can have pelvic and paraiotic nodal metastasis. So, uh, for at least for staging, uh, paraiotic nodal uh, resection is important. For advanced, free B onwards, as you rightly pointed out, lion trial, where we just need to do debulking. Uh, but again, uh, intraoperative inspection uh, says rather inspection <laughs> and seeing that, them directly. That point I didn't touch because that is a surgical domain. So, that's the reason <laughs> yeah, so I didn't touch I that understand. point. Because in Lion Trial, they had a very good CT scan reporting and all. Our many times uh, nodes are missed on CT scan, but when we go in, we definitely see them. So I think watching them, seeing them, and then deciding on debulking, and uh, so that is important. I think uh, you have very completely covered this topic. So <laughs> I'll hand over to the other chairperson. Thank you, Tanushri Jain, ma'am. Uh, now I will request uh, Dr. Prachi, ma'am, to give vote of thanks. Okay. Just one minute, excuse oh. me. Uh, it was a very nice discussion, Dr. Mukesh, Bang, Dr. Tanushri Jain, and Dr. Ashish. Thank you very much. And one minute, uh, I take this opportunity to invite you for to invite you all for the Nagpur Hysteroscopy Carnival, which is on 15th, 16th, and 17th December. So. It's a very wonderful opportunity to have four international faculties and many national faculties. So be there on 15th, 16th, and 17th of December. Thank you Thank very you, much. Man. Definitely will be there. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, Prashi, go ahead. So last and very important uh, note, that is the vote of thanks. Thank you so much, uh, GMC Nagpur, first of all, for coordinating today's thing very well. Uh, Viker, madam, for being there uh, with your students and your staff today. Uh, Priyanka was great. Abhijit was very good. And uh, thank you, Dr. Nikita, madam, uh, Dr. Niranjan, sir, for taking the class so nicely. And this will be preserved in our archives for all the students for always. Um, I have heard Mukesh, sir, speaking before, and I really wanted it to go to more of students. Like, that was not a recorded session. So now I'm very happy that this will be a recorded session, which will be available for all. So thank you, Mukesh, sir, and the wonderful you, discussion Tanushree, ma'am, and you had. So that added to a uh, lot of the stuff, which we, again, in our archives. So thank you so much, Tanushree. Shri ma'am, Ashish sir for being there for today's uh, talk and uh, yes, uh, Sushma ma'am and Pragati ma'am always being there for such a close to heart uh, PG education program. Thank you all the audience and Richard Corona Remedies for supporting this uh, event which is going on every uh, fortnightly and we look forward to many more such sessions. All the students and everyone are invited to please attend us and keep blessing. Thank you so much. And especially Dr. Thank Priyanka Shelkar who was uh, very <laughs> flawlessly Conducted the program and Dr. Abhijit. Thank you. Thank you, Pat Thank you, Thank you, you, thank you, thank you Thanks thank, a lot. Thank you, Tanushri. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Priyanka. Thank, 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 thank you, sir. And congratulations, Abhijit. <laughs> I gave already see Tanushri. Like but I gave you already 100% point on telling the word Bevasism map. And I will say that he remembered PAP inhibitors. That was the biggest yes, thing. That, that was <laughs> I was waiting till I... He was slightly shattery on the PAP part, but 
but uh, i think uh, with I that i think he should say at least that much <laughs> vijit see beta you are you have been appreciated by all Yeah. Yeah. So as as Very a teacher, nice. ma'am, I'll just bring him down to floor. So because you have just a long way to go, right? Your day two ship is, I mean, day <laughs> three ship is just started, right, Abhijit? <laughs> so yeah, so it's just one case done. Lot of Obs and Gainak remaining. <laughs> so yes, keep up the yes. good work that you have done today. Keep up the good work. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. The best, sir. Sir, sir, tell him keep it up. <laughs> thank you, Pratish. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you thank Pratish, madam. Thank you. Thanks, thank all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sir, bye bye.